Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini-lecture on Herman Melville and his work, Bartleby the Scrivener. So, Herman Melville, born 1819 and lived till 1891. His most famous work, of course, is Moby Dick, uh, but we won't actually be taking a look at that in this course. It's a wonderful text, but it is also four or five hundred pages, depending on the version that you're looking at, and we clearly would not have time to cover that in this course. So some things about Herman Melville, um, throughout his life he had several stints at, at sea, and so several of his books certainly do take place at sea, Moby Dick of course being the most popular one. He achieved early literary success. Um, with some of his early novels he, he really did well, but then he started to falter um, in his later works. In fact, Moby Dick, which for him was very much a powerful, important, significant piece, uh, which, by the way, he dedicated to uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, it actually didn't do well. Um, it, was a, it was a flop, and Melville had trouble getting over that um, in later years. He wrote other works, and, you know, some of his best work is his later work, but he had some trouble, you know, with Moby Dick failing, given how much work he put into it. Um, he never quite recovered from that. So he had those increasing failures later on, and I don't. I, I guess we shouldn't call them failures. I mean, they're major successes today. But he knew their worth. He, he you know, he really understood what he was doing, even if nobody else did. Um, and that way, it was you know there was a bit of um, disappointment in in the lack of appreciation for the work that he was doing. So his first major work um, was. Tipe, it was Tipe in 1846. Uh, Moby Dick came out in 1851. As I said, he dedicated it to Nathaniel Hawthorne. Pierre in 1852, and Bartleby the Scrivener in uh, in 1853. And, and pay attention to that. A story of Wall Street, because um, I think that plays a you know that plays a a role within the story that isn't often discussed. And for those that are reading Benito Cerrito, that came out in 1855. Um, so again, for Benito Cerrito, that's worth acknowledging it came out about five years prior to the Civil War. But let's take a look at Bartleby the Scrivener. Um, this is my f one of my favorite stories in American Literature 1. Um, it's certainly, you know, one of my favorite story, one of my favorite stories of uh, Melville. And I think it's a, it's a challenging story for students because, of course, um, well, hopefully when you get to the end, you you can see why it's curious, and Melville continues to leave us questioning and wondering what's going on with this character Bartleby. Uh, and you can find some of the answers, and that's part of what I want to give you here, is some clues as to understanding Bartleby, um, with no guarantee that anyone will fully understand him. So, I want to start, as I usually do at the beginning, and look at a few paragraphs. Uh, one thing we should remember here, as I've said in other, in other lectures, is that this is a first-person narrative. So again, whenever we have a first-person narrative, we should always be suspect. Um, and we really have to pick apart what the person says, because I think, you know, many authors have their characters be betray themselves about the nature of who they are. So, let's start off. I am a rather elderly man. The nature of my avocations for the last 30 years has brought me into more than an ordinary contact with what would seem an interesting and somewhat singular set of, of men, of whom as yet nothing that I know has ever been written. I mean the law copyists, or scriveners. I have known very many of them, professionally and privately, and I if I please could relate diverse histories at which good-natured gentlemen might smile and sentiment souls might weep, but I waive the biographies of all other scriveners for a, pa for a few passages in the life of Bartleby, who was a scrivener of the strangest I ever saw or heard of. So th a few things to, to kind of be aware of. A scrivener or a law copyist, um, they're, you know, they, they are a class of people who are well, writing up writing up documents um, at a time in which, of course, there was not an there was not an easy accessible 
type uh, uh, typewriter. Uh, there's not an easy and accessible press for smaller companies. So today, when we have today, when we need something, you know, written a document written up, we every one of us goes to a printer. Um, you know, goes to an actual physical printer, not a person that's a printer. But in this time, you needed people to, particularly if you worked in law, to write up documents all the time. And so that's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with scriveners, is people who are writing, uh, who are writing copy that needs to be official documents. They need to get where, get somewhere for, you know, certain things to occur. So, uh, I, if you have ever read, and I recommend just reading the first three or four pages of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, because this opening for Bartley B. the Scrivener mirrors in part, or in whole, uh, the opening for The Great Gatsby. And I, I tend to believe that F. Scott Fitzgerald had read Bartley B. the Scrivener, because th the sound of this of this writing compared to what you see in The Great Gatsby, it's it's strikingly similar. Again, you have somebody reflecting on their past and, you know, saying, I would throw away, you know, knowing all other men except for J. Gatsby. And so we see this interesting parallel. When we talk about connecting literature, this is one of the things that we're talking about. You can see a parallel between Bartleby and, and J. Gatsby. So our narrator is basically saying, there, there's this interesting class of people called the Scriveners, and I could write up a good history and a good story about all of them, but really, the only one you need to know is Bartleby. While of other law copyists I might write the complete life of, complete, complete life of Bartleby, nothing of that sort can be done. I believe that no material exists for a full and satisfactory biography of this man. It is an irreparable loss to literature. Bartleby was one of those beings of whom nothing is ascertainable except from the original sources, and in his case, those are very small. What astonished him, what my own astonished eyes saw of Bartleby, that is all I know of him, except indeed one vague report, which will appear in the sequel. So, something to be aware of is the author is fascinated, almost obsessed with Bartleby. And so the question should rise up, why? Why is he fascinated with Bartleby? What does Bartleby have to offer the narrator that keeps him so intrigued? Intrigued enough to say, you know, I only knew him a little time, but that is enough to, to you know, talk about him and focus on him. And that because I only knew him and only I can write about him and nobody else knows enough about him, it's an irreparable loss to literature, right? And when you get to the end of this, you're going to ask yourself, why is this an irreparable loss to literature? And I would ask, is it really a loss to literature or a loss to this person? And this is something that goes, um, that people often overlook about our narrator that I think gives us a lot, a lot, so much um, understanding about who he is as a person and why Bartleby is so important to him. I am a man for from my f I am a man who from his youth upwards has been filled with a profound conviction that the easiest way of life is the best. Hence, though I belong to a profession a profession proverbially energetic and nervous, even to turbulence at times, yet nothing of that sort have I ever suffered to invade my peace. I am one of those unambitious lawyers who have who never addresses a jury or in any way draws down public applause. But in the cool tranquility of a snug retreat, do a snug business around rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds. All who know me consider me an eminently safe man. So our narrator is an eminently safe man who has made a life in a prof and has a profound conviction for the easiest way of life. Right? He says the easiest way of life is best. Right? It, it, you know, to go along smoothly. Right, I've I've never I have never suffered, uh, you know, unrest because of turbulence because of you know the the craziness that is my profession. I am a lawyer who's never addressed a jury. I'm a lawyer who's never drawn down public applause. Right, so there's there's a question within all of this: is is he a real lawyer? 
right? Is you know, is he somebody that we consider a real lawyer? Is he somebody that his peers would consider a real lawyer? A lawyer who's never actually had to be in court, as it were. So it is a it is a interesting thing to see that here is a person who loves to take the easy road, who who finds it, you know, it, it's part of his nature to take the easy road. And he's coming up against Bartleby. And as we'll see, Bartleby, he's not the same. He's very, very different. In fact, he probably could be very successful, but he doesn't take the easy road. Sometime prior to the period at which this little history begins, my avocations had been largely increased. The good old office, now extinct in the state of New York, of a master in chancery, had been conferred upon me. It was not very, it was not a very arduous office, but very pleasantly remunerative. I seldom lost my temper, much more seldom indulged in dangerous indignations at wrongs and, out, and outrages. But I must be permitted to be rash here and declare that I consider the sudden and violent abrogation of the office of the master of chancery by the new constitution as a premature act, inasmuch as I had counted upon a life lease of the profits, whereas I only received those a few short years. Again, let's break this down a little bit. So, he said he, you know, he, he likes the path of least resistance, um, and so he he's telling us here that at some point he had been granted the office of Master of Chancery. It had been conferred upon him, right? He didn't earn it, it had just been given to him. And it wasn't a hard office, right? It wasn't arduous, but, but very pleasantly remunerative, meaning it wasn't a hard thing, but man, did he get money from it. And in a little bit of back history here, that, op that office is eventually, um, is eventually eliminated by the new constitution in New York. Now, listen to his language here, because I think this, again, this is fascinated. fascinating, or it gives us insight to him, as opposed to Bartleby. I seldom lose my temper, much more seldom indulge in dangerous indignations at wrongs and outages, right? I never get mad. I really don't get mad. But... I must be permitted to be rash here and declare that I consider the sudden and violent abrogation a premature act. Because, it, you know, he says, inasmuch as I had counted upon a life lease of the profits. I consider that a premature act because I had hoped to get those, I had hoped to get that easy money for my life, where I only received it for a few short years. Should we really have any sympathy for him? Should we really care or be disappointed? Um... He, he's essentially crying because he got this easy gig with lots of money and then he only had it for a few short years. And that's enough to make him, you know, indignant and, and upset, even though he seldom gets upset or loses his temper. So he's showing us a bit of hypocrisy here. And again, he's showing us this idea of, you know, of entitlement, of, you know, just feeling upset because he couldn't continue to collect as much money as he was collecting for doing very little. And then we come to the very end of, of Bartleby the Scrivener, where we get this report. Right, The report was this, that Bartleby had been a subordinate clerk in the dead letter office at Washington, from which he had suddenly, from which he had been suddenly removed by a change in the administration. When I think over this rumor, I cannot adequately express the emotions which seize me. Dead letters? Does it not sound like dead men? Conceive a man by nature and misfortune prone to a pallid hopelessness. Can any business seem more fitted to heighten it than that of continually handing, handling those de these dead letters and assorting them for the flames? The dead letter office is or was a place in which within the mail system all the letters, uh, all the letters in which could not the addressee could not be found, or the person that the letter was for is no longer alive, and so there was this, pl there is this place. I think in many, um, you know, w within many postal systems, or within, my, you know, whether it's it's the U.S. postal system or it's UPS or what have you, that there is a place where letters that cannot be delivered eventually go to die. Um, and this is supposedly where Bartleby worked. He worked in a place in which all day long they burned dead letters.
They burned letters to people that either were no longer living or could no longer be found. Um, on, a, on a philosophical level, there's a, you know, there, there's something fascinating about this of, you know, if you're working in this environment, you, you are continually seeing letters that do not make their destination. Um, and what kind of effect does that have on you? How does that impact you? And so that's something that the, the narrator is bringing up here. What did that do to Bartleby? Because what did Bartleby do? He went and he became a scrivener. He went and became a writer of letters. He started to write letters for this for this lawyer, and he that is you know that that's a very fascinating, curious element about Bartleby is he goes from burning letters to writing letters, and how are we to understand that? For by the cartload they lo they are annually burned sometimes from out. The folded paper, the pale clerk takes a ring. The finger, it was meant for, perhaps, molders in the grave. A banknote sent in swiftest charity. He whom it would relieve, nor, nor eat, nor hungers any more. Pardon for those who died despairing. Hope for those who died upon hoping. Good things for those who died sti stifled by unrelieved calamities. On errands of life, these letters sped to death. Ah, Bartleby. Ah, humanity. So again, this is our, our narrator's parting comment about Bartleby. And this is important to hold in your mind as you go through Bartleby and think about what Bartleby is doing and why he would prefer not to. All right, that's all we have for Bartleby the Scrivener. I hope you read it and enjoy it and come back with uh, some good discussion thoughts. All right, thank you for listening. See you in the next video.